Thank you very much, and a uh, big surprise. We're going to have a, a, a presentation from the Academy of Environmental Science in a little bit, but um, I asked Mr. Leonard if he might be willing to bring some students, because the Academy of Environmental Science, when we get the presentation, we often get you know, kind of the, the details of stuff, but we wanted to see the faces of what's out there. And to say there's some cool things going on at the Academy of Environmental Science is such an understatement. Um, I am blessed because I've got, I think, I was saying to Mr. Mullen, I think I have at least four and maybe more either current or former swimmers um, and, and anyone who still wants to um, that, that are a part of the academy. Um, and so I get, I, and I even have uh, one of our parents who is one of your staff members now. And every day you would think they're coming back from collecting candy or something because they just are beaming with what's going on. So Mr. Leonard, I'm going to turn it over to you, but uh, this is just our opening is to share uh, with the kids about AES. Awesome. Thank you so much for you know allowing us to present. Guys, why don't you come on up? Um, what I have, what you guys have today are our academic team, um, Ocean Bowl and Envirothon. It's members of our A team and B team. Uh, we have such an interest in being a part of our academic team that we have multiple teams. So you guys come on up here. Um, uh, these students are from all base schools, and uh, they partake partook in uh, Ocean Bowl last year. The A team, which is in the uh, tan shirts, placed 12th in the nation uh, in the National Ocean Science Bowl. Wow. And, um, and that was actually also against uh, China, as well as uh, Canada, some other international schools that came out as well. Um, this year, they are representing Florida in the uh, Florida Envirothon. And they will go down to Boynton Beach in a couple weeks to uh, try to win the state title again. We've won the state title uh, once in three years and for Envirothon, and we've won the state title in Ocean Bowl twice in four years. Uh, last year, we took first and second place. This year, we took uh, second place overall. So incredibly proud of these young uh, men and women who have uh, dedicated countless hours to study about our environment and about the uh, oceans. And also, our coach, Mr. Ward Cooper, who this is his swan song. He'll be retiring at the end of the year um, after many years serving our district. And uh, he is the, the mastermind behind these uh, brilliant young minds. I, and I have to ask, I asked this earlier, but the rest of the board probably didn't get a chance. OK, how many sophomores are here? And uh, so anybody got uh, certified in, in diving? So, okay, when I was in school, I just tried to avoid PE because I didn't want to play dodgeball um, or be the subject of the dodgeball. Um, but you guys get to do something really cool, and I think um, is somebody going to want to share, but I know there, there's been articles, but come on, first-hand experience, you know, conversations. Tell us about it. And, okay, so the, the physicalness, though, of doing it, do you, I mean, is there, does it take, you know, on your body in a good way? I mean, do you have to, it gives you a workout almost? Yes. <laughs> well, you usually cold. So. <laughs> <laughs> so your heart is pounding. <laughs> well, so you all need wetsuits, right? Yes. <laughs> David, did you go to, where did you, did you check out Vanity Springs as well? He was part of your group? Yeah. So yeah, our first yeah. group that we were like really learning this process ended up with a checkup dive at Manatee Springs. And there's a current there, if you haven't swam mm -hmm. there, oh, yeah. in the bowl. And um, so there's a large log at the bottom of the of the bowl and that they had to hold on to to practice their skills. So they had to show, demonstrate their skills in that checkup dive to sh ensure that they were ready to be SUM certified. So it wasn't just like swimming out there. They're down there taking their mask off, taking their BC off, and putting it to the side, and then having to hold still while the current's pushing them and put it back on. So these guys are, you know, at least one step closer to Navy SEAL. Than <laughs> <laughs> and, so. and, and girls too. Our schools have graduated kids that are in the SEAL program. I can't tell you where they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Guys, for people to ask a Florida student, what are you doing? They reply, 
nothing about Florida life here because scuba diving and certainly right. learning about fish. Yep. You should be doing that. You live in Florida and that's great. Absolutely. Especially here. You know, so much of our economy is made up by the nature coast and, and the ecosystem. To be able to get out there and experience and have these kids really ignite a passion for it is, is a blessing for me. And Mr. Leonard, thank you because I know you became principal out there and it was like, okay, so PE, we should be creative. We're an environmental academy and you you went after going, you know, after PE and diving. Um, then had to have a staff and get buy-in from the staff thinking, oh my gosh, you must be crazy. Yeah. We're going to do what? <laughs> I always did, but in a good way. Um, and for those who don't know, you know, Mr. Leonard, uh, you did, you teach, you taught a Renaissance. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, we've had conversations about what Renaissance kind of teachers come out of Renaissance and what kind of learning happens there. And Mr. Leonard came out of Renaissance, was at C uh, Citrus Springs Middle, and uh, of course is uh, at the Canto, and, um, and then also is uh, now the principal there, so we're excited about it. So, uh, and. Yes, you were in. Um, so, did any of you um, qualify for the state science fair? Were you in the science fair this year? Or? I know ABS has had some great entries. Her focus is on 3D printing um, affordable uh, animatronic uh, appendages for people that are uh, amputees and whatnot. Uh, and so, yeah, so we had Nicole. Uh, I'll, I'll bring that. I want to talk about science fair when I come the next time because I think that the culture has, is growing and I'm excited about that. Why judge the science fair? It's awesome. Yeah. Well, we appreciate it. If you mind leading us on the pledge, we'd appreciate it. If everybody would please rock us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you again for having us come out again. You know, it's our annual um, 
Okay. It's our annual uh, presentation to kind of give you guys a heads up on what we're doing and what we've been up to. Um, one thing I want to point out as, as we start is, and, and I've had the, the honor of speaking uh, with Ms. Simmel President at the last couple of events that we've done at AES, and I, I just want to again reiterate the fact that the partnership that we have between Citrus County Schools and the Academy of Environmental Science is honestly, in my opinion, uh, the a benchmark for what charter school and dis school district relations should be across the state. It is uh, clearly the best relationship of any other charter slash uh, school district organization partnership uh, in the state. Um, having talked to other people that run charter schools and other people that work in school districts, it's very contentious um, across the state, across the country, but the fact that we can consistently come together, that we can work together, and that we can plan for what is best for our children. And I think that's what I always hear when I hear whether it's uh, Mr. Mullen, Ms. Himmel, or the executive staff, or the board, it's that we do what we need to do to improve the lives of our children. And that is also uh, at AES and um, uh, our public schools. So thank you all for that. Uh, if you'll take a look at the presentation I put there, or the paper I put in front of you, uh, you'll notice a lot of uh, things that we've put together over the last year. I do want to show you about a one minute video, so I do. I want to be respectful of your time, just to kind of give you a, a picture of what life at AES is like. The audio is not working. Um, so you'll have to watch it without the audio, but again, like last year, I can get it to you um, in the case that you like to hear what the kids are saying and whatnot. Um, so let me go ahead and play that. Mrs. Douglas was here, and she's really good at calling her video without the audio. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I just wanted to kind of clip some things together so you guys can see it and not spend a ton of time. You know, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the partnership uh, on a micro level with the Marine Science Station and Mr. Ernie Olson, the supervisor of Marine Science. Um, he and I are, are as thick as thieves and, um, you know, we work really well together. We, we love spending time with each other and um, a lot of the things that we've been able to accomplish are because of him inspiring me and, and, and helping me uh, get to that the strength really to make the risky decisions, so so to say. Um, one of the really big things that I want to point out is the number of applications this year. We've seen a steady increase in applications over the last three years since I've been with the Academy of Environmental Science. And this last year, our applications were over 320. Um, so we have 70 open spots for the school and 320 uh, applicants. And so I, and that just speaks to the staff it speaks to the students, it speaks to the board of directors that we have, it speaks to the partnership. Um, and, I, and I also wanted to, you know, kind of extend a, uh, an apology on behalf of Michelle Leeper. She had a family emergency. She wasn't able to be here today. But we do have Greg Nixon. He is one of our board members. Um, and he's here, you know, representing for us today. Um, financially speaking, we're in a much more solid position than we were when I got there. Uh, I'll never forget the first or second day I got, I was there, Mr. Blocker called me and he said, Mr. Leonard, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't understand. What, what do you mean? He said, well, you're spending money way too much. <laughs> so I looked at, I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. And, and I learned with his help. Yeah, absolutely. And I learned with his help that we were in the red to finish the year. And from, from him and Tammy uh, to where we are now, uh, Tammy has helped us get through a successful audit in the, the last three years. Uh, and with her help, she's helped us get to a point where uh, we are clearly in the black. Um, and uh, operating at a, with a healthy fund balance. Uh, so again, we would not be able to do that 
without you guys and um, without the partnership. So I want to open up for any questions. Uh, I also want to mention too that our guardian, Mr. Williams, has been there this year and he's been phenomenal. Uh, what a great addition to our staff. Um, and he adds a presence uh, for, our, for the community to come see and, and it's been a, a wonderful experience having him there. So any questions you may have? Go ahead, Mr. Black. All right. Well, thank you all for coming and the students for being here today. Getting out of the next exercise. Um, I just had a question in regard to the facility there in City Crystal River and where that lease stands and what's going on with the facility. I know there's been some uh, long-range planning or there had been some discussion about what happens next, but can you just brief the board a little bit about uh, what's going on there? Absolutely. So we um, we solidified a, a, a five-year lease with the city uh, at a dollar a year. Uh, we were able to bring that down from the $23,000 down to a dollar a year with the city. And uh, with the caveat that we would maintain uh, the maintenance of the facilities. Now, large projects um, is open for debate. And one of the things we're looking at is transitioning from the sewer to a septic system. One of the big barriers is bringing the water across the bridge um, because it stops at the bridge. And uh, so we, we are in the midst of processing through that. Um, however, you know, we have a good relationship with the city and uh, we both are working uh, to keep the school fresh and keep it at a good a good spot facility wise. Does that answer your question? That's, you've got a five year lease basically. Exactly, yeah. Well, so we did in that and we're in year one of it right now. And I, I was I did know that there was that reduction that agreement for yeah. the dollar, which was a great way <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Show their support of ABS. Absolutely. And, and you know, an interesting ad, uh, piece of that is that the, the original pro, the original grant that was used to purchase the property is under College uh, Florida Collegiate Trust. And it was, we, the reason the, the school brought the county into, or not the county, the city, was because we needed a municipality to receive that funding. So uh, we built the Gary Madoff Park, which is about 1,000 feet beyond the school, that provides public access. And that $23,000 that we were paying, that was to pay off that facility. So uh, once that was paid off, then we were able to bring it down to a dollar. But again, yes, absolutely, we're very thankful that the city of Crystal River was willing to do that because ultimately they didn't have to. Um, and that's kind of the, that's the interesting thing is it's evolved, is the intertwinedness of AES and the city um, and how can we continue to grow and expand as a, as a, Program, not a number of students, but a number of activities and programs. Now you know that um, you might bring the county in because I know you're leasing from the city, but there's a lot of county development beyond you. Um, and they very successfully just brought sewer and water across the river, even the Halls River Bridge. Uh, so it's been done. There's a good comp for um, you know cost estimates um, and just bring the county in and maybe you can get that thing right. Over. Your bridge is a little bit longer than Halls River Bridge. Yeah. Um, it should give you a good idea of how much it would cost and if you could get the county to join in the game. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. I, I, we will definitely, you know, explore that. Yeah, I'm sure they want to pull those guys that are beyond you. You're right. Yes, yes. And, and ultimately, connect it to the beach. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to keep pumping that out. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. So one of the questions I've had, and, mm -hmm. and I, I, I reached out to you because I, I, I the budget concerns me, not your budget, state budget funding, and particularly the challenge is, is you have some new teachers, mm -hmm. um, and you have a smaller, you know, uh, community there to draw from. So, is, we think in our community, in our size district, teacher salaries can really have an impact on us when we're small. But it's even it's even tougher, or could be, on a small school like yours yeah. where half of your teachers were under, let's say, the states, if they set a floor on us. Right. Has that been something you've looked at? Because yeah. that's a cha that, that could be a challenge, and, and one we want to make sure, obviously, that you're successful in doing, but um, 
I just didn't know if that's been something you looked at. Absolutely, and you know, honestly, it's it's leaning on the staff of, of Citrus County. You know, it's leaning on Dr. Heber and uh, Mr. Mullen and Mr. Bishop and um, Miss Wilson to, to talk about well, what are they? What is the, what is Citrus County doing? Because it's, we're a microcosm of them. I mean, I think it's a very similar percentage of the amount of money in the general fund that Citrus County Schools spends on salaries is what we spend. I mean, it, it's probably very similar in that percentage, right? A large chunk. You know, 80% of our general fund is spent on salaries, and so um, that's a that, that's something that we're aware of. And, and I wouldn't sit here and pretend to say that I I'm an expert in it. That's why I love the partnership that we have because no other district can I sit down and call someone on the staff and say, Hey, I need some help. I'm the charter school. Can you help me walk me through this path? Every other district say, Kick rocks, buddy. You need to figure it out because that's one less school that we have to compete with. Um, so we're again, and not, I'm not dodging the question. No, I'm just no, saying no, you're fine. I'm going to depend on the people that know what they're doing and you know trust them because and, they've gotten us here. And I really bring it up not because I think you'll, I think we'll, we would find a way to work through Absolutely. it. Um, but I do think it's one that sometimes the state may not have looked at is to say public yeah. charters um, could be underfunded. Uh, Listen, as a result of that, with regards absolutely. to teacher salary, it could be very impacting to them if all of a sudden half of their staff they've got to bring up, and, and in our case, we may be less than that. It'll be a very interesting story to see in the next few months as legislation continues to move through and, and eventually get passed, how that impacts public charters across the state. Um, the good news is, is that we are in a very stable place and a very stable district that you know works together. So it'll be us looking from the outside in instead of the, right, the reverse. And the other one is, um, you mentioned the partnership and working. Uh, I believe you're part of the missile yeah. as well. Yeah. And I, I thought that was great because that's, again, something uh, uh, Mr. Mullen has, has been had his co-work group with it. And, and you know, missile for those of you who don't you know, remember, it's a, it's a great opportunity for our, our leaders and future and emerging leaders and our current and, and emerging leaders. And uh, I was glad to see that you were uh, included as part of that. Absolutely. I mean, I was incredibly blessed by Mr. Mullen and um, Ms. Boyd Taylor to allow me to be a part of that. And, and also by the board of directors to help, you know, cover some of the funding for that um, to make that happen. Uh, and it's been it's been a, a wealth of information for me as a school leader, as well as a, you know, as a husband and a father, you know, setting systems and um, strategic, being strategic in my planning and things like that. So uh, thank you for that opportunity. All right. You know, I just want to point out to the sure. program that Mr. Kelly alluded that to and talked a little about that with ceremonies. But, uh, you know, what a great program that is. Yeah. I think uh, Mr. Goddard up and some other yes. that were a critical part of that, right? But uh, yep. just to be able to offer that, we hope that that can continue. And I know your board uh, probably sees the benefit of that program. But with that, um, is there any plan for summer? I know we do the coastal camp. Mm -hmm. We need such a coastal camp. What is the AES involvement in those summer programs to? Well, I mean, that would be an interesting question that I would, you know, definitely want to, you know, talk to the executive staff and the Citrus County staff about how that would integrate, um, because there's a lot of there's a lot of the weeds of that. Um, our students apply and go through the process just like every other Citrus County, well, every other Citrus County and surrounding county student that can apply to Coastal Camp Citrus, because um, as Mr. Olson has shared with me, that that's open to other county students as well. Um, and so it works through a lottery, so students are able to get a, be a part of that. Um, our teachers are able to apply for the supplemental positions, just like any other, because they're Citrus County employees. So um, we are in the process of trying to develop a summer camp for upper elementary students, um, something of a day camp. Uh, it probably won't be this summer, but that's something that we would like to do in the future to provide students with an opportunity to get on the water and to um, learn about the environment and really build upon the things that Mr. Olson and Mr. O'Leary have built at that curriculum that they have built there. Those fourth grade standards um, that are so important to the fifth grade F F FCAT science um, and really you build upon what the foundation they've laid. So. Thank you so much, guys. Again, it is a it is a blessing and honor to to serve under your leadership and under your vision. And um, uh, here's to another great year. You're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is school support services. <clears throat> great logo, by the way. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> 
Good afternoon. I ask the board to approve the instructional and support recommendations as listed on the golden rod. Okay. board's approval for Janet Tuggle to be named principal of Christopher High School with an effective date of March 31st, 2020. Move approval. Second. <laughs> I, have, I have a motion by Mr. Kennedy, a second by, I think, Ms. Brown, their partners, um, to approve Mrs. Tuggle as the new principal at Christopher High School for the years 2020-2021. Uh, Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> you want to say something? She has her speech already. It's <laughs> it starts with an R. <laughs> well, I wasn't prepared, but thank you so much. I'm over the moon excited. I walked on campus about a week and a half ago and asked Dr. Connors for permission to come back aboard. So I'm very excited to be a pirate again and look forward to uh, reacquainting with the staff and the students and, and just um, just seeing what the wonderful things that are happening at Chris River High School and just keep all those wonderful things moving. So thank you for your support. And thank you because you were, you were one of my last assistant principals at Chris River High School and you, you did a fantastic job. So we're looking forward to a, a good year at that school. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tuggle. Moving on. Um, Mr. Bowen, finance on the what, whatever you call that. <laughs> the band, is that good, Mr. <laughs> Thank you, Lance, also for fixing our clock. We, yes. None of us could <laughs> <laughs> accomplish. That, that reminded me when we had to change time in the classroom, all the short guys would say, let me change the clock. And I said, no, we're we'll waiting for the tall guy to get here. <laughs> and, you know, and of course, uh, Mr. Fletcher has a connection to AES as well because his wife is the amazing Don Fletcher who's out there and uh, so we, uh, we appreciate all she does. Good afternoon. If you recall, Lance and I came before you fairly recently and talked to you a little bit about the possibility of us exploring other options for our internet and our WAN. And so we actually did conduct an, the RFP process. We had six companies submit their proposals for consideration. And after the evaluation, the intent to award has been uh, given to a company named Zayo. And so contingent upon board approval and approval of the E-rate, we would like to proceed with moving forward with Zayo as our internet and our wide area network provider. Lance is going to present some information because I'm sure that you're a little bit curious about the company. We currently use Spectrum and so since this is a new company to our area we figured you would like to hear a little bit more about that. So Lance? Uh, so um, we chose after going through the RFP we, we like the at least uh, dark fiber option solution for uh, it was seen to be the most cost effective and where we will gain a lot more performance uh, and reliability uh, with this solution. Um, if you see on your screen, um, the top one in gray is what we currently have, very similar to this, where if you notice on the right, the Technology Resource Center, it has to go through all these hubs and switches to get to the end of school site. So say Chris River High was on the, on the left. Each one of those um, hubs or switches that has to go through is another process that has to happen. With, with that comes time. Uh, any one of those fail, there's issues. Um, and those are usually the calls that we have to put in where we've been struggling with support um, over the last couple of years with uh, Spectrum. Um, on the bottom, 
would be what we would be moving to. So the Technology Resource Center would have a direct fiber connection to the school. There's nothing in between us and the school. It's a straight connection, almost like we're in the same building, going from school to building to building. Correct. And with this solution, we take all the, you know, we don't have to call anybody. It's on us. So if there's a slowness issue, we're going to know it's something with our equipment. It's not something we have to go to somebody and ask. Other than the line being cut by construction or something, this is 100% burial. Everything is underground. So really, it's protected from hurricanes tropical storms, car accidents. Uh, and last year we had an issue with car accident home Sassa that took home Sassa down. Uh, so. I remember that. This doesn't, this straight line doesn't, like the first one that we've been using, looks like they have to go through multiple things to happen. <coughs> Correct. If this direct it eliminates, shot, it eliminates we still got all those firewalls and stuff like that. Up. Correct. Okay. Yes. So. Yep. Yeah, it's a, and, it's, and it's more secure it because really we, okay. we're not on the same network as anybody else. Those lines are dedicated to us. So we're, with Spectrum, we're kind of on the same network as everybody else in the county. We just have our own separate VLAN, but this is totally dedicated to us. So it's much more secure. And with each of the, the current system that we have, the switches, um, do they not also go through a type of computer um, system as well, and what I mean by that is, is that not not just the lag, but you also have the security features that are basically slowing the, the system down because you have to account for the security at each of those. I want to say node. Yeah. Um, as um, opposed to now, you're you're directly you're only dealing with their end and our end. Correct. Um, I mean, we are in our own VLAN on that network, so that is secure. But we take all their switches and their equipment at our location out of the equation. It's pretty much they're bringing the fiber into our building and just handing it off to us. And, and if I recall, switch. especially when Spectrum took over the hub and all of the aggregates around it were where we were all of a sudden having trouble with, Correct. was it not? Yes, I had to back and forth communication with Spectrum. Basically, I was saying there was an issue with one of their hubs and they're saying everything looks fine. We don't see any issues. I ended up having to route traffic from the Technology Resource Center through Crystal River Middle and then over to Crystal River High for it to work correctly. Once I kind of showed them the, the data and the proof, then they, they, were, they dug in more and then eventually found the problem. And that included like an address. You could at times, some addresses could go through a certain hub and you might have other addresses. I mean, different, Correct. different yeah, times where you had issues. Yeah, these hubs are all over the town. Where in this case, again, if it's working on one end, it should be working on the other end. Correct, yep. And if there is an issue, it's, it's definitely on us. So we are taking that responsibility with this solution. So you know, we have to look at ourselves as something that is not working correctly. I'm just with the spectrum. Is there the spectrum. I know if something goes down here at the school system, I know when I get home, my computer's going to be down at home, too. If it goes down at home, if I see that, then I know when I get here. I don't know what the connection is there, but there definitely is a connection. Yeah, I mean, if you live nearby, yeah. you're probably on the same hub as the school. Is that, uh, yep. I must, that's must say, because that's how it does. I'm yep. not. <laughs> I'm not <either. laughs> Rub it in. I got it. Really excited when I, when I was uh, hearing about that was it Zayo? I thought maybe that will go to houses too, you know. Oh, mm -hmm. how it well, no, it won't go. So, so it won't well, go. It won't be part of the community service. So it'll just no, yeah, this is strictly for the school system. Correct. Mr. Dot? So, you know, we look at the cost. I mean, we're talking, um, you know, over 2.4 million uh, total cost um, after we add in the, uh, the annual. Fees, but this is E rate uh, dependent. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it reduces the cost of the district significantly. Yes. So about thirty-five thousand, another fifty thousand, so under three hundred thousand. But we're going to be paying that uh, off in uh, over four years. So I want to have the assurance on the E rate funding that it's approved. It's approved for all four years. It's, it, if it gets right. approval, it's not approval for one year, we got to get back for another year, we got to get back for another year. It's approved for all four years. True. I'm not sure really. how the great funding works. 
for the special construction yes. I have a I have a slide that kind of breaks that all out. I mean, I mean, I mean your, your assurance to the board is that it's it's, it's not going to be a cost that we're going to be stuck with later if we only get one year. I mean. So the way E-rate works is we have to apply for everything every year. So when we have our internet and our WAN currently reimbursed, we apply for that every year. So the construction cost, we would not enter into this unless we received approval for the construction construction cost, because that would be upfront. And then we would also receive approval for the WAN and the internet payments that we have to make monthly payments on those ongoing and that we always have to continue to apply for E-rate funding on that and that is there's no guarantee that they're going to continue to provide that but we're in that situation right now even with Spectrum there's no guarantee that they will continue to provide us E-rate funding for our internet and WAN. So the, the big cost, the construction cost, we would know that before going in into, into this that they would pay that 90% year one. Right. Well, so they would pay their 90% in the beginning, and then we would pay our our 10% would be, Zayo would allow us to pay it over for um, payments, for so yearly payments. $2.35 million, or let's see, I'm sorry, the $2.115 million, $2,150,000 million will be paid up front after, if E-rate approves it, right? We're going to get that payment in. Right. Correct. So, and of course, if E-rate doesn't approve it, Obviously, we don't have a contract, right. correct? Because it's written in the contract. Yes. Correct. Okay. So you know, it is a significant savings to the district, um, and you know, I'm I appreciate the fact that you guys have done your homework on that and, and, and looked at this as an opportunity now. And Mr. Mullen, you know, had advised that time is of the essence because you, you need to get this in before the end of the month. Right. Right. But I just want to make sure. You don't feel rushed here. I mean, you feel like you've done your due diligence, you've done the homework on this company and on this product, on this fiber um, network. I mean, you, you, you don't feel like we're jumping into something here, right? So Lance is going to have a slide where he showcases the company, the school districts we reached out and spoke with, and we are not the only school district in Florida considering moving to Zayo, so that helped make us feel better as well. Um, and when and he'll speak more to this, but Brevard County is also moving with Z They did an RFP and Zayo won their intent to award. And when he, the gentleman that Lance spoke with did the same thing that we've been doing, reaching out to other school districts that are currently using Zayo to find out, you know, what their perspective was. And he said that everything he heard from the companies, the school districts using them was positive and supported exactly the same findings that Lance and I have had. But he'll speak to that a little bit more. He's going to discuss the pricing with you and then also make sure that he discuss what we found in our reference checks. Okay, so the next slide shows um, Zayo is currently in our district right now. That's one of the reasons why our, our special construction cost was as low, I don't want to sell as low as it is, but it is extremely expensive. But um, compared to the other bids, they are significantly less expensive. Um, the blue is their current build, what they're currently in the county uh, putting in. Um, the orange would be what we would be adding. Um, I know it shows AES, that long one out to the left, um, those would be handled by a third party. That by having the third party handle that extension, that saved us quite a bit of money in special construction costs. Um, so they would Zayo handles all that, or Zayo, sorry, um, they handle all that in the contract. So we wouldn't have to apply for anything extra with e rate for for those two locations. It's all free. But it says own Zayo fiber, owned by who? Well, Zayo owns all the fiber. We we lease it from them. It's a lease. That's for it to be degradable. We have to we have to lease it from. So them. they already have fiber in, or this is for us? Yeah, down the main roads, and so you'll notice all the blue. That's the <coughs> pretty much the main roads that they're they're they came down through the county already. And who it is? Yeah. Right. Um, I can. He's uh, Josh Nelson from Zayo is here. Um, I, 
probably prefer that. We all have that in a bed at home. And so uh, we're all trying to improve that. So that's really what's... <laughs> we're we're going to be very transparent about the fact that our schools are a priority. And second to that, our homes are. And cell phone coverage. Yes. Well, so that, that's a nice segue into answering that question. Um, Mary, okay, I need to step up. So, um, Please state your name. Josh Nelson, Zale Group. So I'm, I'm the business development manager for the state of Florida, and we are in the process of building out Central Florida, an expansion of our national footprint. We didn't have much of a presence in Florida. We didn't have any presence um, in, in Central Florida specifically. Um, but the, the driver in building out this $250 million worth of build across the entire state is, is um, one of the wireless companies. So we are targeting all of the, the towers in the area. So the, the reason for the build piece that you see in green is, is a build connecting tower to tower to tower throughout the region. Will that be part of the 5G system? Well, yeah. Yep. So it's, it's, Thank you. it's, 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 it's <laughs> okay. So directly to your house, no, but hopefully the, the cell phones are. Well, that, that'll work. <laughs> yeah. this, this could be a really weird question, but on Highway 19, you stopped just north of the Ozella Road and you didn't go all the way up to 44 West. Is that a future plan? Uh, I, that's, I would, a, that's a major artery. I would, I would say it's th this is definitely the starting point for, for our build, that anchor customer of ours, the wireless company. But absolutely, I can yeah. see Their, their long-range planning is to tear up that area too. But, you know, you've been through Home Assassin, but now that project's already been approved, so they're going to start digging there. Might be a good time to put that in. Maybe so. Um, what, what you don't see is at the end of every one of these lines is a, is a tower, right? So um, the, the reason for a build and the routing that we took was was to connect those, and, and you, you'll see that we call it a lateral that lateral segment that comes from one direction and stops and stops because of the tower. And there may be a slide on this, but the new builds, what's the status on when they'll be complete? Um, so the the, the new build piece of yeah I, I'm, I guess my question really is I'm assuming the new builds impact uh, being able to 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 re, you know to merge to trans to uh, transition to this so I'm wondering you know tomorrow next week oh, next yeah. month are we going to be able to we we wish it could be next week. yeah and I, that's why I'm, I'm trying to get that our, our our wireless customer wishes as well. But no, um, th this is a, a project that is well underway. It was an 18-month build um, commit to our anchor customer. And um, we, we're, we're, we've got right at 40 crews working. And it's, as Lance mentioned earlier, all underground. And the, these crews are, are placing 25, 30 miles of this per week. Right now. So it, it's, it's a feverish pace. Um, Are you allowed to tell us who your anchor customer is? Um, well, there's four wireless companies, and I'll, I'll let you guess four times if you like, but after this microphone turns off. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. CDMA or? <laughs> <laughs> so, you always had trouble with so, phones. And <laughs> there you go. Uh, a bit of a long-winded answer. I wanted you to have the back story there. Um, the, the, the bill is, is expected to complete um, first quarter, second quarter of 2021. So it, it will spill over into next year. But this build segment, these build segments rather, in, in green, align perfectly with the additional build required. It's, it's not like we have to circle back to do this. We'll be able to do it all at one time. Uh, a question about the wireless. Anytime you call, say, the other district service center, someone's calling you, you're calling back. There's one number it'll go to. The general number, you do not know who calls you ever because you don't have an extension that comes through. Will, will you be able to do that to put an extension to every call that comes in? Because you waste a lot of time trying to find out who calls you. Yeah, he's not a part of our phone system. He, this is just for the internet and the WAN, the wide area network. Well, I'm talking about to the schools, uh, to, uh, when you call the schools. If you call the main number, someone mm -hmm. say you call me. And I call back to the school, but I don't know who called. Me. Could be you. Oh, it just shows you the school call. Just says the school call. Will there be any way to 
make that better because so much time is wasted trying to track down the Trying to figure it out, yeah. Gotcha. Um, I can check with Vertex. They're, they're a company that, that handles our, our phone system. I think it just shows the call ID from the school. I'm not sure if external, when it leaves our network, it, it's going to lose that detail, you know, that, that granular detail of who's calling. It's supposed but to I, leave I, a message on your answering machine. <laughs> and just so I understand, so I, I see all the new build areas. So, Lulzeo, when you lay fiber in our new build areas, you're going to lay fiber that's going to help other companies as well. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. Yeah. How does that, to explain to me how that works if we're owning this fiber, are there Diff different fibers that are, I mean, you're just laying a whole bunch of fiber uh, network or fiber cables that, how many fiber, how many fiber cables do you bury? That's, that's a very good question. Um, the, the cross section of the, the fiber cable itself, I mean, the, 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 the light that, that sorry, it goes down the glass, that, that glass is the size of one of your hairs. So, for each one of the schools, there's two fibers dedicated. The, the cable has multiple, we call it pairs of fiber, one for transmit, one for receive, right? Um, a, a relatively small, in the scheme of things, fiber in, in this day and age, just because of the, you know, the increase in bandwidth need and what have you, 144 fibers would be in a, a cable at, at, at a minimum, maybe even 288 fibers, it's multiples of 12. Um, but anywhere in, in green, especially what we call our backbone, the main path passing through, and then we have the laterals going out to the towers. Those, those extensions to the schools, those extensions to the towers could be you know, a 48 count or better, but that, that, that would be a, a minimum fiber count. I think in, <clears throat> that brings up a good question, or, or I think good information for us. If I recall though, Every one of those customers that ultimately could hook up to this long term, do they not contribute to the E-rate tax, which then we benefit from? I mean, I thought that was also some of what happens with E-rate is that that as a as there is more availability of fiber in an area that people get into, part of the way we get funded through E-rate is through through that tax that's created. Yeah, the, the, the where they get the funding for E-rate is there's a, I, I believe it's on your wireless bill. There's right. A, there's a line item for. So I mean, we kind of contribute to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Oh. By I'm saying by by having this there, mm -hmm. the more consumers that use it, the more taxes they pay on that, that we benefit from, and we don't have to take property taxes to accomplish that. Which is good. So how does we, year five look? Um, okay, let me move down to, so that's what our pricing looks like. So internet service is included with our, our monthly reoccurring bill. Um, so we would pay $400 per location, um, 27 locations. We would pay $129,600 out of pocket for all the locations. Um, so after E-rate, we pay $25,920 a year for 40 gigs to the internet, and internally, it's unlimited. Whatever equipment we have in the school, whether we have 10 gig modules, 40 gig modules, 100 gig modules, that's the bandwidth we would have. So we would be much faster, and um, also, Zayo is a tier one internet provider. So currently, right now, if a student were to sit down at their computer, and go to Google, he's going to hit six of Spectrum's hubs before he actually gets to the internet. Whereas AO, they're going to hit two. One at our site, one in Tampa, and then we're off the internet. So that spread over how many students we have. We're going to be much, much faster, much more uh, bandwidth. And so I think the large, large road with, you know, few, uh, fewer, <laughs> this is the slowest down. I'm sorry, Lance. We had a little private joke going on here. It had nothing to do with what you were saying. <laughs> we'll try laughing. Are there any uh, 
equipment that we have to purchase? No, this yeah. is no. It's it's straight. They just they come into our network closet basically, and they just hand the fiber off to us, and we come we connect to them and plug right into our switch. So there's mm -hmm. no equipment other than they do provide a switch for for the internet. And this is our what we are currently paying and our uh, our bandwidth to each of those locations. So we currently are paying for for a total cost for internet and bandwidth at much lower speeds. We're paying three hundred eighty-two thousand three hundred twenty dollars a year. After E rate, we're spending seventy-six thousand four hundred sixty-four dollars. Our teachers appreciate you saving money. And again, the, the the proposed yearly cost was going to be what fifty? How much was that going to be? Fifty? The previous oh, slide. for the yes, it's uh fifty-eight thousand seven hundred fifty for the construction the construction cost. But after the four years, it'll be yeah. like twenty-five thousand. Correct. The twelfth elementary school is Crest. Yes. Yeah, that would be all twenty. Crest is one of the schools, yes. In the, in the, school. yeah, the next, the next slide had had, it, had twelve schools, yeah. Had 12 oh yes, Crest. Yeah, Crest is one of the oh, one of this, Yes, sorry. There's another question for you. These um, people would love to have a motion. I move. Do you want uh, us to go through the? Sorry. No, go ahead. Um, so one of the, the key factors is us being funded by E-Rate. So one of the, the things that really triggered was uh, Zayo has had 100% success rate with special construction. They haven't been denied. Um, and they've been awarded over $205 million in E-Rate special construction since 2017. And um, these are the references I've had a chance to check over the past week. I've sent out many more than this, but these are the ones that actually called me back or, or emailed back and we had conversations with them. Very little problems, if any, that they had. Um, they're very, extremely happy with their customer service um, and very uh, few issues. Brevard County, I talked to him directly. We had a great conversation. I was actually on the way over here when I was talking to him. And uh, they're in the same situation we are, basically the same area, same process. and. They, they're extremely happy uh, with the company. They did the same things with Ms. Androwski you already talked about. They call people the same thing and they've had the same exact results that I have. So and this is a positive and everybody we spoke with, we asked when you have had any kind of a concern, how long did it take to receive a resolution? For example, when fiber is cut, you know that, that takes down internet connectivity and weigh-in connectivity at a site. And so we asked about that and the turnaround time in each case was was quick in fact one school district i believe in texas they had said a, a fiber had been cut and they were back up and running within two and a half to three hours and that included the 60 mile drive the tech had to make because they had to come from dallas now why that's important to us and probably to you miss powers is well because we recently spoke about Lacanto High and if you recall Lacanto High lost their phone on a service on a Thursday yes. and it was not until Tuesday before they had the fiber repaired and so in that situation the vendor that we were using for the for Lacanto High for the phone line is not who we use for our internet and WAN but we could have been in that same situation without connectivity for the entire school to the internet and the WAN, which just makes my heart go really, really fast. <laughs> so um, the fact that everyone we spoke with felt that they had very quick turnaround time for, for repair of fiber cuts, which is really what we're looking at. That's what, but since it's buried, that's what it would be. If, if it went down, um, it would be either on our end and if you recall in November, December, when we were having some internet issues, I, I believe we spoke to you about the situation where we spent several days where our vendor was arguing with us about what was going on and they were denying that it was on their end. 
And even though I, I finally said, I said, you have got to listen to Lance. He's trying to tell you. And then finally, after three days of arguing with him, Lance was right. And so we would take that out of the equation. We would know if it's on our end or if it's on their end with a fiber cut. And so that would help to, to resolve the issue faster as well. And we like to hear about the success that y'all have had at the D rate because we were a little touchy in that area. <laughs> we are. Yes. Yes, we are. Yes. Do you have any more questions for no. Josh? Um, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, that we approve the 2020 slash 59 dedicated Wiber WAN request for proposal. Is that correct? Is that what did I say? Did I say Fiber. 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 RFP. RFP. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Kennedy, a second by Mrs. Bryant to uh, award the recommendation for the 2020. Dash 59 dedicated fiber one FF RFP to Zale Group LLC. And just if I could, um, one, <clears throat> I've and Mr. Goddard sits on some of these committees um, now, but the RFP process and and, and what you went through, um, the, the winning bid was significantly higher than everyone else as far as the way your team rated. Uh, it, the scoring on it. And I thought that was pretty significant because it didn't just cover one area or one concern, it, it did the, the entire. Um, so I, I appreciated that. And then someone who's been quiet on this, but I, I know behind the scenes did a great deal, and that's Mr. Bradshaw. Sure. Thank you for oh, your work on, on this, because I know it was a lot, and, and I understand actually you all worked really well with Mr. Bradshaw to, to there, execute that. So. Was very, very good to work with. So we do appreciate that. Thank you. And you said she's in Boulder? Yes, ma'am. Oh, good. This is Pat Goldschmidt. We have any problem we'll call a former board member. <laughs> I just because Mr. Kennedy, I, I kind of I don't know if I heard you right or if you may throw me throw me a curveball. So you you know one of the things I was going to say is you know the RFP form didn't have prices, but you just said there was this bid is significantly higher. I, what I'm sorry the, on the points on the points that we had here. Okay. Uh, for example, on the ranking, the the ninety right. I mean, they came out at ninety seven. The next closest was seventy four. Okay, so yeah, you were because we didn't get to see the total costs of the other bids, though, did we? On the RFPs, I, don't, I, don't I mean, they, they weren't in here. So just curious, how did those look? I mean, I know Ms. Wilson's back here. Is it were they? They were, gave them quite a bit more points. I think they ranked the points for the price based on the cheaper the price, the more points they mm -hmm. got. That was a factor in the. Right. Um, I just I, I like to see the dollars. I like to see the bottom line bid on the form. So so for example, one of the other companies that could offer the the fiber, the least uh, lit fiber, it was significantly higher by millions. So that factored in when we evaluated the pricing. But I think what Mr. Dodd's asking for, he'd like to see all the pricing. Yeah. yeah. The ranking and the pricing. The rankings. Yeah. And, yeah. and we have a form that shows that. Right. Where it shows, I mean, I you all use that form. when you do the bidding, right? Well, I, yeah. We can show you the second one. Would that help? The, the one that came in second? We have a slide for that. Well, I mean, I am satisfied with what right. I've been told by right. staff and everything. I mean, but I'm just just saying for for future. It would be good. Yeah, I I, yeah. I, I, we, I would I would like to see. I would like to see what we're doing. Because there is a bid sheet where they show yeah. all the prices and they can just yeah. get those to you. And and that and brings that up a very point good. that. I know this, we are comfortable. This is not a bid. This is an RFP. Right, right. right, but they still got prices from all the other right. companies that they could share. Right. And it doesn't so necessarily go to the lowest bidder. Right. 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 And that was what I was just going to say, just for clarification of, right. of, of that. We're comfortable with that because I think we understand that process. But um, while it doesn't necessarily go to the lowest bidder, um, there are a multitude of factors of what rises those those points. Right. Um, and that's really what uh, what I was focused on because those points really do affect. I mean, you could have a low bid, but terrible service, 
that could result in high costs to the district, and so that's those factors that we we do that. And I, I, I see Mr. Stokes over here because he knows that as we go through other RFPs, where he's like, okay, this may be cheap, but it's going to cost us in the long run. Um, so that, example, that's one that's, that's important for us is a reference, and then also we want to know if one of their ref at least one of their references we prefer to have uh, a school. A school district so that we know that they understand the nature of serving a school district so that's yes, it something we call for the vote okay. okay i'm also trying to get us through my five o'clock <laughs> all right all those in favor uh, aye. aye opposed aye. motion passes five zero thank you very very much mr nelson for, for coming and answering questions we appreciate that very much thanks for having me yeah. I'm going to recess the regular hearing. We still have more on the agenda to hear, but we're going to close or re recess this meeting, and we're going to open up um, our special hearing, public hearing, um, for the purpose of the option. Public hearing is to receive public comment on the recommended materials for our 2019-2020 instructional materials, adoption in the area of world languages, computer science, and career and technical education. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I just come before you because we need to see if there is any public input on the materials we're requesting to adopt. Any public input? Any public comments? Any public comments? One more time. Any public comments? And then this then rolls over to going on to our agenda then for approval. Is that correct? Yeah, the public hearing. All right. All right, we're going to close it for public comment. We will go back to our media agenda public hearing. And I'm going to reopen the regular meeting for public uh, for streaming. <coughs> Good afternoon. Um, I come before you today to uh, solicit some board discussion and to seek direction to either award or reject bid 2020-24 for single stream recycling. Before we uh, uh, go too far down the road, I'd like to give some historical background about the recycling program we've had here in Citrus County and what leads us here today. Is that okay? <clears throat> we've, um, we have a contract with Land Lakes Recycling uh, from 2014 to June of uh, 2019. Um, in that contract, in that bid, we were actually receiving money back um, as part of the recycling, so there was a financial incentive for us to, uh, to do that. Over the five years of the contract, we received just a little over uh, $10,000. Um, in the fifth year of the contract, uh, we were notified that there would be no refund because the, the market for, essentially the market for recycling had changed and the profitability was not there for the, uh, for the company. <clears throat> the contract ended in 2019. Um, when the contract ended, we were contacted by the company that was providing the services to us. And that they told us that it'd be a little over $1,800 a, a month if we wanted to continue. By by virtue of the contract uh, expiring and the cost for services exceeding uh, certain thresholds, uh, we felt we needed to go back out for for a rebid. Okay, and we did that. Uh, we went out for rebid. Um, it was um, uh, advertised in October. Uh, we received uh, received the bids in uh, November, and we're essentially here today just to find out what is, what is the direction of the board, what what's the, the flavor of the board uh, in terms of moving forward. Um, there is a financial increase. Um, when the contract expired with the uh, recycling company back in, in June, in midsummer, we had to increase uh, the number of dumpsters uh, to take away trash. 
So that cost us $18,000 to do that. So we've already incurred $18,000, if you will. Um, when we sent it out for bid, the most responsive uh, uh, bidder uh, came in at a little over $41,000. So having said that, the net increase for the, uh, for the board, if we were to recycle, is going to be uh, approximately $23,000 um, moving forward. So today we are, we are faced with, the, you know, the, I think the conversation should focus around either option A or option B. Do we award the bid? If we award the bid, we know it's going to be in, in total uh, $41,600 uh, for services. Uh, or option B, do we uh, reject the bid and then just continue to incur the cost that we began to incur once the previous contract had expired? So that's where we're at. What is the county doing right now? Because they have some stuff going on, and I know we, you know, we are not necessarily concurrent with them as far as having to use them. But I know they're they're talking about universal garbage. They do. Do we know if they're talking about universal uh, recycling at the same time? It's my understanding they're in an exploratory phase right now. I don't know that a hardcore decision has been made, but certainly I would yield to Mr. Phillips if he's familiar or anyone else. Very accurate. They're exploring right now the same options. Yeah. And Mr. Kennedy, I think in the last meeting they uh, canceled or they're picking up their container for Ellicott City. Or is that true? Is that the last of them, too, I think? Do they still have some of the fear Oh, they do. Okay. I know that they have struggled with not getting recyclable things in their containers, and so that's created a... Uh, yeah, they, um, yeah, they put those couches next to the bins. Are we still under the mandate of the state for forced recycling in schools? That was years ago. Not to my knowledge, I mean. Okay, but there was a time uh, where we had to do 80% of our recycling, and I, I, is that expired? I'm not aware of that being in effect now. Certainly, we can we can explore that moving forward, but I'm not aware of that. The challenge with recycling is that it's 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 costly. Yes. I mean, it's not a, you know people we I have a friend that um, out of state that owns a, um, a landfill, and they only reason they they went into recycling was to reduce the amount to try and get longevity out of the landfill, but it actually costs them a fortune to do it. Um, but now we're, we're taking the recyclables that we're putting in these bins and we're putting them in the landfill. Oh, we, we are, but we're paying a premium to, to not do it. Mm -hmm. I want to know what, what is actually done in your recycling in this school system. What is, how is it handled? We were doing single stream recycling before, which, which basically they take all the recycled material in one container. But if you've ever gone out and seen recycling, if anybody throws trash that's not recycled in there and contaminates the recycled material, oftentimes that would just end up in the whole floor. But in the school system, do you think that that's done? Is that another? Absolutely. Well, I, mean, I know you it, go to it's school recycled side, containers. You, you're, you you're stand here. and watch what kids are throwing in. We can't put a person in every trash receptacle. And that's what it would take to keep somebody from throwing trash in a recycle. But at least ours are chained up and behind fences after our trash are set. Yeah. How much does a custodian cost us a year, roughly? Very roughly, off the top of the head, um, low 20s. Are we going to have to reduce a position in order to potentially have this? I mean, I, I'm, I, and that's a concern of mine too. Is is we're adding a cost. It's a good steward situation, but but does that impact now, the, you know, the the budget? Well, I think I think certainly in this budgetary climate, I think anything any dollar spent is going to have to be scrutinized because the numbers are uh, are difficult at best at this point in time. And I know they're still in session, but uh, I would venture to say that anything we bring on, we're going to have to figure out what we're going to be willing to get rid of. Exactly. But don't we want to teach the recycling is something we should be doing? we should be doing but doing it properly and maybe teaching it properly to be done because i think recycling is very important and it's not just to say well they're not doing it right so we're not going to do it at all you know it's like you say uh well they're not doing the algebra right let's not do the algebra at all anything else 
Like, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, if you think that that's all going to a recycle center, you are misguided. Oh, I've, I've been out to a recycle center. I know what you're talking about. I've also been in the school system where I thought they did a pretty good job of <clears throat> taking whatever was there and putting it in the right place. I didn't see a bad job being done. Now, I didn't go out to outside and see what happened there. I did not. Anytime somebody throws food or something into one of those receptacles that contaminate the products that are in there, that has to be either somebody's going to clean those products or they're going to just take it to the landfill. Mm -hmm. It's a profitable business. It's a poor cost business. It's not, uh, they're not doing it. People aren't picking up recycling just out of the goodness of their heart. It's a, it's a profit. If they can't make profit on the product, then they're going to charge us for it. But, but I think what we're talking about is, is, a, is a service and not necessarily either a curriculum or, or, I mean, when we, when the kids put trash in the trash can, they don't necessarily know what then happens to it. When they put it in the recycling bin, our assumption is, is well, we're doing a good thing, but in reality, the, the trouble is, is it's still not the process. The process, I agree with. I mean, I, I think, you know, those of us who, when you have scrap metal, when you have, you know, uh, separating your lumber, you know, in construction sites, there's a lot of things that are done that are very, can be, can help offset your costs by doing that. In this case, we're just saying, we're trying, we're, if, if we were reducing the garbage consumption and, and getting that full benefit then into recycling, I think we'd be accomplishing something. But right now what we're saying is recycle, but it's gonna, by the way, you're gonna have to pay 15 cents for everything we're going to recycle. Um, it, it's, I, I'm struggling with the, the cost factor of it. Not mm -hmm. the, I, I absolutely agree with the, the mission of recycling, but what we've learned over the last decade, it seems like, is that recycling comes at an at a, a actual cost. And it's difficult for those of us who are, who are managing taxpayer dollars because how do we you know, how do, where, where does that lie with us? Because that, I, I just worry about that. That's, that's the only thing. I agree with Ms. Powers, the stewardship of it, but it's the cost factor that I'm struggling with. And I think that's what we have to focus on, the cost. And I again, focus on both of them. Well, I'd like to say, if I could, you know, I've wrestled with this. You know, we teach kids the importance of recycling. We want to reduce waste in the landfill, especially those recycling materials, but yet we're not going to have recycling programs. I mean, it's kind of, you know, do as I say, not as I do. I, I wrestle with that because I don't want to have increased costs. You know, I suggested some ideas and, you know, I mean, I think it's a good discussion to have here. I mean, what can we do? Um, you know, what's the desire of our school advisory councils? How do they see recycling? I mean, one of mine was teacher said, well, we're taking recycling help with us right now because, you know, right now we're not recycling. You know, some of the schools have the blue containers out, some of them don't, but none of them are, it's not, we're not in a recycling program right now. So that's kind of tough too, because I don't know if we want to get into that, um, and you know, other schools and other districts have environmental clubs, they have students that are stepping up to, you know, be a part of the solution. So I would like for us to come up with a program that we could continue recycling somehow, either at a reduced cost or at an added buy-in uh, from those who are in the community who feel very strongly about it. And, and want to help us. And want to help. Yeah. But as was mentioned, you know, if you have a student, if you have a school-based program with students involved, you have to have staff members involved with that. We saw and, that with the Academy of Environmental Science. They, they came up and they told us what they were doing. And that could, like you're talking about, apply to the cycle of those too. They can even be leaders in that. But we do know, according to these cost figures, if we don't recycle, we're going to have to increase our trash disposal program by $18,000. We've already incurred that. That's okay. the previous uh, contract. Okay. We're currently incurring that. So we're currently incurring that now. That's correct. Right. Uh, so in reality, it would only be, it would only be about $23,000. I mean, could we get school advisory councils on board, could we get the education foundation on board? And as I've kind of gone through it, you know, maybe rather than having every school doing something different, 
maybe we should try to focus on the $23,000 it's going to cost us extra and see if there's support in the community that could help fund that money where it wouldn't cost the district any money, but where there would be individuals or groups that would step up to the plate, not as much to do the work, but to come up with the money and come up with the funding for it. I don't know. I mean, that's... It's a problem for all of us, and all of us want to see a solution to all of us be in there working to make a solution, to have a solution. I really like your idea. Really like your idea. I brought up the fact that we don't recycle in the in the summer. So could we cut two months worth of these costs? Could we cut two weeks of Christmas, a week of Thanksgiving, a week of spring break? Obviously in talking to staff, well, we have to rebid it, I guess, because actually I'm gonna give have, you a few I'm, moments to think about that because it is five fifteen and we have a time certain for citizens' comments. <laughs> 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 um, we're going to move on to citizens' comments, um, and I have two green cards. Each each listed speaker will be allowed three minutes to make a presentation. Speakers are asked to address the issue at hand and refrain from using obscenities, vulgarities, or other breaches of respect and refrain from words or statements, which from their usual construction and commonplace acceptance are construed as insults or tend to incite violence or breach of the peace. We ask that you model the following character traits, cooperation, responsibility, citizenship, kindness, respect, honesty, self-control, and tolerance. The school board will not discuss or take any official action on any presentation. Any persons present who wish to speak must fill out a green card, which are located at the back of the chair. And the chair calls the first speaker, Victoria Smith. Uh, Victoria Smith, Citrus County Education Association President, as well as a teacher at Citrus High. Um, hello to the board, superintendent, chair, assistant superintendent. Um, I'm requesting, perhaps, I don't know if it's really a request, but maybe something can be done for um, in policy for students making false accusations against um, staff members. Um, right now, in the Student Code of Conduct, um, the Acts of disciplinary intervention has inappropriate behavior, has if they're making false accusations. But it's right now up to the administration whether or not a child has a discipline. As you know, if someone makes an accusation against a staff member, they have to be pulled out, there's an investigation. Sometimes if DCF is involved, they can, and HR of course has to do this, they can be out for months. In that time, then the students, other students also are being affected by that because, of course, the every day of classroom is not being attended to. Then when the when they find out, HR as well as human resource, sorry for people that don't know, um, human resource department as well as DCF, if they find, you know, there's nothing to be, there's no uh, accusation whatsoever, it's, it's false then nothing is being done to the students now. Not everywhere, some principals do discipline the child, but it's not happening everywhere. So it's the discretion of the principal. So my concern is that some students are doing it again, and then another student does it. It's just, it's holding, it's made, letting students know, hey, I can get that teacher or that staff member, that aide out of the classroom if I don't like them. And that's a concern to me. So. I'm just hoping maybe the board can look at maybe writing up, thinking of some policy or something that perhaps maybe can, you know, have something in there to stop this from happening. Because again, we know that we have to investigate. But if it sends a message that if you're going, to, if it's true, yes, definitely report it. But if it's not, you know, you're disrupting the whole classroom. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We take a pretty hard stance on that, and if you've got particulars where something has gone, if you could bring those specifics to me, I'd be glad to Thank you. A second uh, green card is from Mr. Josh Smallstack.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, George Schmalstig, founder and CEO of Filter Family Solutions, uh, formerly known as Filter Youth Development. We've recently changed our name to uh, uh, better uh, inform the community what we are all about. Uh, first of all, two things. Um, uh, Mrs. Simmel, the picture of you in the paper uh, with that sign. Uh, <laughs> was priceless. Uh, I came home from a business trip and saw that and uh, uh, I celebrate with you. Thank you. I really do. I'm, I couldn't be more happy. I appreciate all the work that you all do and uh, all the staff. Uh, I live with three people who are thriving in the Citrus County school system. Uh, my two children and my speech pathologist uh, wife. <laughs> so, uh, it's a great thing when a man can live with people who are thriving. So uh, I wanted to come and share with you um, something that's happening right now. It's a really big deal uh, to our very small agency. Uh, Representative Mazzullo, uh, this session, he introduced uh, House Bill 3923, and that was an appropriation bill for a filter. Um, and so it looks as though that is going to make it through the legislative process and will be included in the budget that's submitted to uh, Governor DeSantis. And so um, that appropriation is $250,000 for our organization in the next fiscal year. So how that breaks down is $50,000 for operations and $200,000 for a capital project. Uh, we have a property on Home Sasser Trail that we've leased off of the Citrus County government. And so now as the attention turns uh, from the legislature towards the governor's office, we uh, need all the support we can get in, um, in, in writing letters to the governor. Um, and the turnaround time is quick. I will tell you the last uh, day I have, uh, I've never experienced so much love from, from Citrus County. Uh, we've got constitutional officers that are turning around letters like that. And um, I've been in the juvenile justice system for uh, 22 years uh, working in government and I've never seen government uh, move so quickly. And so, uh, uh, Mrs. Himmel, uh, when we started this um, more than seven years ago, uh, I came to you, I spoke to you. Here's what I knew in starting an agency from scratch. Aside from the fact that it would probably be doomed to fail and it would be very, very difficult. Uh, on one of those accounts, I was wrong. Uh, I knew that I had to have the support of our sheriff because it's a delinquency prevention program and I knew that I had to have the support of our superintendent and uh, honestly if I didn't get that support I really don't even think that uh, I would have started and, and we we gained that support so I'm back here to ask for your support uh, by way of uh, board support in the form of a letter to Governor DeSantis turn around on this is quick uh, <coughs> I actually need this uh, by my close of business tomorrow because these things are going to be hand delivered to the governor the office on uh, on Thursday. We got to uh, ask the um, the chairperson to execute a letter on our behalf. I don't know if the school board would like that to approve funding. If it's in the if it's in the budget. Eight hour turnaround, twenty four hour, eighteen hour turnaround. Yeah, I don't know if they would I think it too might be more impactful because we, we've talked to Mr. Mustula and Senator Simpson pretty friendly um, and I think probably if you want to use your tag as Citrus County School Board members um, but I think it would be more impactful if, if you do the individual letters and, and basically if I, I think you said the amount of letters uh, rather than who they're coming from. Well, it, yeah, I, was, I, I don't, I don't know. It's going to be most impactful, um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the quantity or, or, or the, the, the quality, what, whatever it may be. Uh, but what he's asking you to do is, by board action, write a letter approving of his program and and supporting funding. And I can buy a best in, and I'm sorry, but in 15 years, I see the first person to ever walk up here and ask for that to happen. I can't tell you. 
I always love being a trailblazer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Mr. Bradshaw, I respect that. I do agree, with, I, or I see where you're coming from. That doesn't preclude us. Uh, that doesn't. Um, impede us as individual members to have to to decide that we want to at least write a letter yeah. as Mrs. Council. So, so, this so is our business. <clears throat> it, I would I would then ask just if yeah. if the chair maybe could, could direct um, filter to go ahead and maybe send each of us an email that just gives us some synopsis of, of kind of that piece of it. Um, I know you mentioned the bill, and then each no, of us could get that out of here. Uh, I will have that to you within an hour. I knew you will. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, but I, I think, and then I just, you have our support for sure. I appreciate that. I still remember years ago, um, I think at the Lincoln Day dinner, you being the man of the year. Uh, the first recipient of the Jeff Green Community Service yep. Award. And that's on my shelf at home, I take pride in that. Yeah. I appreciate it. If you um, would include, if you have it, the emails, of the governor and so forth. I have them, but, but not everyone may have them right at their fingertips, and that really is helpful to just have that, uh, yes. so, that, they, that so that it gets executed within hours. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I have that email already created. I, I sent out a lot of them yesterday and been great, getting great response from our local government and constitution. Are you wanting letters printed out and handed to you? I, I tell you what, I think it's the best way to do this. Um, uh, just, just email those letters to me uh, as a PDF and then uh, I'll compile all of those and those will go off to the governor's office uh, as soon as possible. And then I don't know if it's possible that we, we have we have a lot of employees that we can reach out to just with the push of one of our buttons to all school personnel. I think we can't do that. <laughs> Okay. I appreciate your uh, your willingness. Hopefully they're watching uh, the show. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I will tell you, as a 22-year uh, veteran of uh, the juvenile justice system, uh, I've been, uh, many times I've been in that situation where I've had parents in front of me that uh, are in crisis and they need a referral. And there's been plenty of times when I've just had to give a referral that I didn't really think, I didn't have confidence it was even going to work. And uh, and what I think about every day is, uh, is when, when, when school staff and whomever are sending referrals, I want them to be confident that uh, uh, we're going to put our best foot forward and, and do a great job. And we're doing that. I love to see people uh, confident in us. I appreciate the uh, vote support uh, from all of y'all. You'll have an email in an hour. Thank you. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Any other comments? I have no more green cards. Comments? Right. Bishop, we're going to resume. Yes, ma'am. Recycling. Yeah, essentially, uh, before the, the before the board today is the, this, this essentially the decision is to either accept or reject the bid. But um, I know we had talked, um, we've had some brief conversation about uh, the potential of backing out the summer months, backing out the uh, holiday breaks. Um, the current bid, as it, as you see here today, it does have a provision in there that takes into consideration that we don't work all schools don't work year round. Uh, during the uh, winter break, during spring break, so there's already a consideration to back that out. So the 41.6 is respective of those times, if that makes any sense. It's already been taken out. Exactly. So saying it's got yeah. it. Not to the, it's been, a, it's right. been given consideration. It's been given, given, in the bid, it's been given, given consideration. Okay. Yeah. And Johnny, could, could we not, uh, not vote on this, postpone it until the next time, and have time to go and talk with the uh, people in the county and see what they're doing so we can have maybe some sort of partnerships. Certainly, I would defer to Ms. Wilson because my understanding there are time timelines uh, or time frames in which she's had to be accepted or rejected. But you can reject the bid and go out for another bid. Yes. You, you have an open bid, so you can't go in to talk to another agency about what they're doing. You would have to reject this bid and then talk to the county. And if you decide not to go with what they're doing, then we would have to put out another bid. So we can't go talk to the county while we have an open bid in the process. So at this point, we either have to reject this bid, um, accept this bid. Is, the bid, is there also where if we were to table this, it would, the bid would run out and then would, in essence, that's our just, a rejection. You just can't do anything more. Yeah, but, you can't, but you can't have a conversation about it if we no. table it. Correct. And you can't go out there and try to find a better deal when you have a current bid Correct. on the table. Correct. So either reject it or accept it. Right. So, and just so I understand, right now, as of right now, we don't have a recycling program in place. So, right, so if we, we ran out. 
program. And yet, there's not to say there aren't groups collecting things and doing those kind of things. I'm sure that's happening, but not, not at an organized level. Right. Not a formal result. Not a formal result. And I'm assuming that if without a, a commitment of a school that's doing that, that's following it from the time that they put it in some bin in a in school or in a classroom and then ensuring, as Mr. Dodd was saying, whether they're taking it home or to, or a staff member is committing to taking it somewhere, it's going to end up in the landfill anyway because the custodian's going to come by, see that and say, well, we have, we can't just leave in, in the some recycling case, items there. In some, cases that happens. in some cases that was happening when I was seeing the spring recycling store because it was getting contaminated with trash and it was more expensive for them to clean it than it was for them to dump it. I thought of that you could leave, you could just leave recycling set around here and then you're going to have a health hazard. It's going to, you're going to end up with all kinds of different problems. And that's where I think the concern is, is that you, you, I agree with the learning process, getting a commitment, but, but at this point, we either have a service that's doing it that we're paying for, or then we have separately then have to have a conversation about can schools, you know, how we support schools having individual recycling programs. When you talk about a recycling program and an education program on how to teach kids how to recycle. Right. How long is the bid uh, uh, good until, when does this bid expire? Oh, we don't have a bid right now. If, we, if they approve we have, it, how long is the replacement? Oh, it's three, three, three years or two, two one year rules. Okay, no, no, and I'm sorry. When is this bid no longer? We have to make So, so you, so you've already awarded the bid. We have. No. Well, we, you know, the fact that they give us your intent to bring it. The intent is to bring it right. today. Right. 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 They're the one. They're awarded that. They're the winner, they, but it has to have more approval right. tonight. Yeah. Yeah. But they bid their stuff based upon, you know, you got to submit all your documents by a certain date, and it's going to be taken to the board on a certain date. Because if they don't want us to have, to have an open bid sit here for six months. <coughs> And well, just for, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Not that it would be six months, but you And this is where I'm at. We have a budget that we do not have clarity on yeah. coming from the state. Um, approximately how much would this impact if we wanted, we had an aid in a classroom? Yeah. An aid in a classroom, I think, is is, is going to be about. You mean $23,000? Right. $23,000 difference. Rough, rough up numbers. Close to one and a half. So, I mean, I just have I have a real hard time with that. I, I, I want this, but if tonight you're telling me I have to make a decision between a custodian, uh, one and a half aides, I just don't I just don't think I'm, I'm there yet. I want to be there, but I I mean maybe we can rebid it and have a conversation about it and, and go about it. But if tonight we have to make a decision, I, I can't support it. I like what Mr. Um, excuse me, but Mr. Dodd said about getting it into our community and yeah. seeing if there, are, if there are clubs and organizations that would like to help us monetarily or ever how they can help us. Absolutely. With, with recycling. And it should never be a choice, I feel, between having a and having a recycling. That something's wrong with mm -hmm. So therefore, we go to what you two are saying. <coughs> And I agree, but right now we're looking at that for what, and I think Ms. Wilson's not going to give us great news here in the budget update. I try to it, move it is to the going, top of the agenda every time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, I think it is the difference of those positions that we're talking about. Yeah. And, and that's concerning to me tonight to feel like I don't think we, I, I have trouble committing to that. And we've been told the last several meetings that we have to watch every dollar. Um, and I, I appreciate I recycle personally, Me too. Um, Me too. but I'll tell you, as I go to, I go to the recycle bins off Highway 19 on Veterans, and as I'm putting my stuff in, I said, well, somebody else throws their garbage in, this is a waste of my time. Um, and I, I thought personally, you know, that 
I'm, why am I going through this? You know, but I'm still doing it. But I've got to look at the cost, and we've got so many other things. And I'm sorry, but I think a custodian and an aide in a classroom is more important than yes, taking is. recycles to the landfill. Um, we already have the, the, the thing that if the kids want to get involved with the community project or something like that and recycle. Um, we had a teacher at, at my high school who would load his truck up for we were under construction and he, anything that was metal. That man individually took all of that stuff to recycle all on his own. So I'm, I'm saying right now, I just, until we see how this dust settles with our budget, I just, I can't, I can't go to spend any more money. I, um, I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. You don't make me I was just, you know, well, I still think we can come up with a solution that mm -hmm. we can still have a recycling program without having to spend this amount of money. Um, and I think there's value to getting input from our school advisory council and our parents mm -hmm. and our students as to what they think we should do. You know? So I would like to see us having a recycling program back in place. I, I just, I think we've got to come up with some alternative ways of making that happen. And just as a rough number, I mean, and I know it's not exactly what this way, but we've got 21 schools, 23 if you want to count all of them. If, if they would have to each kick in $1,000 of their SAP money or contribute something along those lines in order to do it. Um, well, we have and that's not to say they wouldn't, but we have the Education Foundation. I mean, maybe someone in the community would want to to donate to the foundation, the Education Foundation, to allow recycling. But again, for, you know, I remember being a student at Emerson Middle School when they first started recycling newspaper. Yeah. You know, and there's always been a focus on the need to recycle. And, you know, sure, the market has gone gone bad on the raw materials that the recycling materials but that doesn't mean it's it's always going to be that way so I, I think that I want us to be cautious and I know what I know what we're saying is we reject this bid and we but then we've got to come up with a plan right to either rebid it or come up with a solution because we need a solution the county solution they may be getting rid of all of their um, locations where they're having these recyclables, where they had recyclables, but they're still going to have it at the landfill. I've, I've already felt they're not closing their recycling center at the landfill. So they're always going to have recycling. It's just that people may have to travel further to take the recycling. What I'm saying is what can we do to still have an impact on recycling with our students? And maybe, maybe right now it's not the newspaper. Maybe it's the plastics and the aluminum. But what can we focus on to still reinforce what we're teaching them? To reinforce the message that it's that recycling um, and the environment is important. So that's kind of where I am. But you know, I I, I don't want to have to spend any money on it either. I mean, we made what ten thousand dollars in the last four years. It wasn't much. The last five years, we made a little over ten thousand dollars. Well, that's that's okay. not much, but it, it, you know, that's right. Yeah, that's that's a better direction. Yeah. So, I like that direction. And it makes me think about a lot of entrepreneurs. I just watched a program where these guys were looking at billboards, um, and they they were buying yeah. billboards made out of this vinyl, and they're they're making um, little satchels out of them, little duffel bags out of them. And they're they're billionaires now, so we have to wait for that entrepreneur that's going to come up and, and get recycling back into our country and and find use for it. The, the kids, I. I'm sorry, but the kids understand recycling, but they're reading the same news that we're reading, that it's going into our landfill. And so we've got to be really careful of what we're educating them. Do this, but it's not going to matter. Or do this and, and be positive about it. So I think we need to maybe take a step back and see how we can really teach what the condition of recycling is right now. Um, because right now the kids are going to say, well, you, yeah, I'm recycling. I'm a really good citizen, but it's going in the landfill anyway. And and I think as as what's been I would just echo what's been said here. We need the community's help on this. Mm -hmm. This isn't something that we believe we've got the solution or the answer on this board. We are asking for help from the community to say, help us figure this out. 
we, we are constrained by economics to just simply throw money at the solution. We need help to solve this. And I think we can solve it and make our world both a better place and, and teach our students the stewardship of, of recycling. With that, I'm going to say, though, that um, I'm going to make a motion that for tonight only, that we um, reject bid 2020-24 uh, single streaming recycling. And I would just add to that that I would ask that uh, both the community and we as a school district and as a board that we look to try and find a, a lower cost solution to provide street, um, uh, recycling within our schools. So you're saying to reject the... Uh, only because tonight we're having to why? reject, only for, only because we have the but bid. The but uh, but I think we accept the idea that we need to, to do something. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Kennedy, a second by Mrs. Bryant to reject the bid 2020-24 single screen recycling um, from, from single screen recycling to full waste full flow. All those in favor? Um, I saw the discussion. Okay, one more. So is there a way we can add uh, an item in there to say um, with the understanding that, I don't know, in April or at a workshop, we can. Right with me. I think I we can direct that be... afterwards, but I think we have to reject the bid. Right. Okay. Am, am I not correct? Procedurally, right. we have to reject right. the bid. If we could ask if you we could have take a look at it again. Is it in the motion? No. No, we can do it accepting or rejecting. But, but but as soon as the bid's over, somebody could can yeah. can, can okay. suggest that Absolutely. the board make direction for that. And we can put it on the list. That's not part of the motion. Any further discussion on the motion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. I think that's the saddest aye Mr. Dodd has <laughs> ever. <laughs> it's it's uh, sad for all of us. I was pretty sad. I, no, it was. They were all but. but. <laughs> so, 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 so what do you want to like, look at it again in April? Well, I mean, we've got to have a little time, but is there a way we can get those SAC meetings? I, I mean, I just finished a lot of mine this last week or two, so. But we have one more in May, is usually, I think, is. is sometimes they have a little bit of information. Oh, I had one on that they scheduled in May. One of my SAC meetings. Yeah, not a workshop, a SAC. I mean, that to me is a face-to-face. Mm -hmm. Well, and the SAC committee support clubs. So if, if each one of the schools had their little environmental recycling club, then the SAC committee can support that. That's an idea. So here's yeah. something, too. We could ask if, you know, for the chairs or to, to get to filter out to the chairs that they would put on their agenda. And, you know, each of us would let's try to be there. And let's do the presentation, too. Let's right. That's what I was going to say. And, and talk to them about it so that we can get that feedback, try and get that buy-in. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to find out why we get the bid. Yes. On to the next movement on the agenda. Information items. Right. It's cash and investment report. <laughs> and I assume the investment report was before the last, <laughs> last week. Our, our, the investment report that you have um, was for January. And um, in January we did receive it was about $235,000 in interest. And um, I just got the February numbers. We got about $285,000 in interest in February. And um, unfortunately, on, um, let me see what day this was, March 4th, the Fed did reduce the target range by 50 basis points. So we will see our investments um, go down right now, and this is in response to the coronavirus. And um, so we're still holding strong. Um, I did receive some CD proposals that were like 50, 45, 50 basis points where we were looking at 250 a couple months ago. So um, it's hitting some of those type investments a lot harder than um, 
hopefully ours are in more are in more stable things. Um, government bonds and governments can only invest in certain things. So um, we are keeping an eye on it and trying to keep our funds in the most lucrative ones that we have at this time. So um, January and February are generally our most um, interest generating times because we have such a nice influx of the tax money. So um, of course those are going to be our highest months. But we will definitely see, they're saying, um, through the end of this fiscal year, a decline in the rates that uh, we're receiving. So we have to go to uh, the, the investment banks, whatever, and say, uh, I know you're giving us 1.5%, uh, but we really want 1.7%. So. We're very restricted in what pools we can invest in. We can't just walk up into a bank and say, we need you to give us an investment. That's why we are in. Um, pools like Florida Prime and Florida Fit. There's other ones out there, Florida Safe, and they they all are geared towards the government entities that are regulated by, um, you know, they're regulated on what we can invest in. So um, low risk, yeah. So. Low risk, low risk. With that. <laughs> With that said, I wanted to address some of the, um, I'm trying to find, I had this up, from FSBA, some of the things, um, Mr. Kenny is very good about sending us out items, and right now the House and Senate are battling out, um, you know, the teacher raises, and just to give you an idea, the Senate had um, the $600 million we were up to. But with that, they were reducing the BSA to $18.64, I believe. This would give us, if we you know, discount the fact that we're increasing our FTE, the BSA of $18 would give us about $250,000 more for next year. And um, you know, some of our representatives are saying, well, that's going to be enough to cover your FRS. And our FRS is looking about 1.2, so 1.2 million. Okay. Yes. 1.2 sure million. That we all and so, so if the BSA yeah. is reduced to $18, we're still having to come up with about a million dollars to meet that FRS mandate. And it doesn't seem that, um, even though the districts have pleaded with them to make this a gradual increase, they just figure that we will find the money is from what I'm, you know, the articles I've read. And um, so, as I said before, the House and the Senate are the closest that they've ever been in the total funding. And for our district, it was coming down to a difference of about $7,000. I mean, I've never seen it in the years I've done the budget of them being that close. So we pretty much know how much money we're getting. It's just what are they going to make us do with that money? And that's what they're battling out right now. So, um, Ms. Wilson, did you see what happened last night? Um, and it's okay if you didn't. So. I've read all your articles. Okay. And so last okay. night they, okay. they, the, they, they could not come together on that proviso language okay. and right. to get it into the budget. And basically it has to do with that the House wants to more strictly define what a teacher, classroom teacher is. The Senate has been sticking to a more broader view. This is kind of still, we are back to that main issue. The, the House has already passed this, so they were waiting for the Senate. The Senate need, needs a uh, two-thirds majority. The, the Democrats have a, they have enough to nix that and they made it clear that they, as a caucus, that they would not approve it. So it got, basically they canceled, they, they can't pass the budget in its current form. That kind of goes into almost like an impasse or what we think of as an impasse with, uh, you know, in bargaining, of what happens, and so now they kick it back up to the chairs to kind of now force the budget to take place which really now means that we're even more limited as to what that, that proviso language is going to be, or the implementation bill language. And, and it's, it's really up in the air. So I, I think that, you know, it's, I, I haven't heard the $18 come back yet. I think it's, it's 
back at closer to the to the fifty dollars, but the but no one knows in the budget where the FRS is going to land. Right. And so that's really, I mean, that's to me my. I mean, it's like we get through how they're going to define a teacher, which is concerning of how that's going to be, um, and then the next piece of that is what they're going to mandate. Will they mandate a type of floor or an expectation of a floor? And one of the biggest issues that came about is that they want, the House wanted that the plans for, or how the spending is done to get approved by DOE. And that was where the Democrats kind of, you know, held the line and said that they were concerned with, with doing that. Um, I think that you know I can see both sides of this. The problem is we're running out of time and we need a budget pass. And and I think the other biggest concern is how the virus, which is a new piece of this, how the virus is going to impact um, the budget because right now they are setting money aside. So there's a lot of moving parts in the last couple of days. It's kind of one hour it's this and one hour yeah. it's that. So trying to keep up is, and we appreciate you keeping up. It, it's, it's been, it's really, really hard. I have been on the phone texting back and forth with FSBA, trying to, you know, to, to keep on top of what those changes are. And honestly, it's been difficult. And I do not envy the legislators because I do believe that they're trying, that they're, their hands are tied. And, and right now, they couldn't, they, there was even at one point an effort to try and make a train bill out of kind of a, a surprising educational little bill, and it added to this bill that was only about 20 pages, it added a 230-page amendment that was then withdrawn. So, it, I mean, there's there's so many vehicles they're trying to get this through, and a lot of it's because, as a lot of you know, the session was supposed to end this Friday, and that's not going to happen. Yes. They, can, they won't have the 72 hour cooling off period to be able to make that happen. So pray for the legislature, and I mean that in a good way. So I found my little quote that I wanted to. Uh, Chair Kelly Stargell did make comments to the press following the Senate's offer that she believed the 18.64 per weighted full time equivalent student increase in the BSC would be enough to pay for the FRS contributions. So, as we know, it's quite a bit short, so um, that's where we're at with the legislators. And I know Ms. Hemmel's pleaded, and you guys have pleaded, and other districts have pleaded that we need help with that. And once we know where we're at, then we'll be able to come up to you with better numbers and a better budget. And I think the roughly $73 a student cost of FRS seems to tie with your expectation of what you think ever us would run us. Yes. Any other questions tonight? We appreciate what you do. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Right. Attorney Legal Matter, anything with the shop? Besides keeping us straight? No, the only thing is that we have the workshop Stoning Douglas, and you're probably the best person to say we need you is being Mr. God. It's up to the board. I mean, I, I think I'd put my list in there. I think it'd be a good idea. I mean, I guess we would pay you to be there, but I think it's, 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 it's a good idea. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, we need to uh, approve some minutes, and we got into the habit of maybe. Lumping them all into one motion. Let's do that. You're the best at it. I like that. Do you you make a motion? I gotta find it. Okay. <laughs> I'll help you. Thank you. We need a motion to approve the minutes of the January 28, 2020 administrative hearing special meeting and workshop, the minutes of the February 11, 2020 administrative hearing and regular meeting, and the minutes of the February 25th administrative hearing special meeting and workshop. Move approval. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Bryan, a second by uh, Mr. Kennedy to approve the minutes of the February 11th, February 25th, and January 28th. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion stands 5-0. Um, any other business that needs to come before the board? We could citizens comments at 5 minutes. Oh, at the end of the meeting, yes. The citizens comments at the end. Do you have no. Are you a citizen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's the, just on some of the board reporting. Um, I, 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 I love the idea of going to the SAC committees. Um, I say SAC because we all know that, but Student Advisory Council, uh, School Advisory Council. And uh, and maybe it is something, too. I don't know that you're when you're meeting with them in the but. Maybe that's it. even if they, even if you can't, maybe if they could assemble the student, the superintendents council at the schools and the local advisors there, maybe could ask some thoughts about the uh, that. Um, the the Cronola, uh, <laughs> I was going to say the the uh, the virus seems to really be impacting um, our day-to-day -day lives and uh, a couple of things one I, I just really want to thank the superintendent the executive team and the district for the communications and the effort to try and and help our public and our students understand that we're working on things um, I, I I know seeing something may sound like a small thing but the superintendent I believe shared that we're getting um, sanitizing you know hand sanitizers but I think that's like the cost of almost $100,000 in order for us to accomplish that. And before you go any further, we've had hand sanitizer in our schools, which is trying to increase what we right. have. And, um, and we're monitoring the soap, paper towel, because everybody's washing their hands a lot. And, that, and, and, that, glad about it. and I am so, and I'm so appreciative. So it comes to the second phase of this, because I know, and Mr. thank you, Mr. Bishop, for stepping forward, because you, you know have your team has been on this my son goes to Florida Institute of Technology in Melbourne he was informed today that they are not going to have commencement uh, for the public they are only going to allow the graduates in I am not suggesting this by the way but I do think <laughs> right now that um, we, you know we unfortunately had to we did not but the state canceled the science fair there are a number of things that have happened in the state that I think that's going to continue. And I just didn't know what provisions overall, not necessarily for graduations at this stage, but, but if, you know, can you give us some feedback? Mr. Bishop, before you speak, may I speak? Absolutely. Um, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've been on four conference calls, two yesterday and two today. They've been from the governor to the um, Department of Education, Commissioner Portman put on a couple of them. Um, three of them, um, all the fast boards are on there. We were all on there, and then today also the transformers. The message today that we received from DOE and Commissioner Corcoran directly was it's business as usual. Um, what everybody throughout the state is doing is preparing in case something happened that we had to close schools or something kept struggling. Every Wednesday, in fact, last Wednesday and then tomorrow at 2.30, we meet with our team, we can put Vicki on our team. Um, we have our head nurse on there because she gets, she's on a two o'clock call with the state, with the Department of Health. And um, so we'll stay on that, but some of the recommendations have, like number one, travel. There, and Commissioner Corcoran was very clear at the beginning to say, this is a recommendation, but then he's very clear at the end to say, you are the superintendent, you are the elected official, you control the your district. So, um, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Um, so their recommendation is for out-of-state travel, that we should suspend, and we keep saying, recommendation only, that we should spend, suspend out-of-state travel if it's by air. Because um, mm -hmm. he said if you're driving kids across the state line or something like that, it doesn't seem to be as big of an impact because they still stand firm that our kids are low risk. The state DOE is working with FLBS that um, they're working with getting them servers that they should be at probably by the end of April. Um, don't hold everybody by the dates. They should have about 400,000 um, student capacity at that time 
for districts to tie into them if they needed to immediately. Um, most districts in yesterday that they were not prepared for all these online courses and, and making sure our students could go back to attendance and those type of things. In our county, our attendance policy remains the same. If a kid is sick, they, the parents send a note in and they will be excused because some, I think a couple of districts have kind of wavered on their attendance policy but we're telling parents that we're staying status quo. So they're on it. I probably will have another conference call with the state to deal with on Friday if anything was to change. So we'll certainly let you all know and try to keep an update going out on Friday. Mr. Bishop. Yeah, I'll give you a real quick overview <coughs> of some of the uh, things we've done to uh, better prepare ourselves. Um, we know we've identified uh, just under 1,500 instructional spaces across the school district. We've added, uh, we've ordered 3,500 sanitizer refills. Um, each of those refills has 1,500 pumps per per refill. Uh, those will be coming in in the next few days. We'll start seeing those come in. That, that should come in. We've also added uh, additional dispensers, uh, or extra uh, dispensers to put in places where either hey, there's not a dispenser or where the dispenser there um, is not functioning properly. Um, We've also um, put an order in for the necessary equipment for us to begin a process in our transportation department for post bus uh, dis uh, disinfecting. Um, Ms. Farmer and I have met, and uh, once the product comes in, or when that comes in within the next few days as well, our, we're gonna have our bus drivers, um, uh, have staff uh, sanitize the buses uh, with the appropriate chemicals after each post truck, so the bus will be cleaned the next morning. Um, we've increased, we use a product called Santa Bombs. Uh, we've increased our stock in that, our inventory in that. We've had, actually, we feel very, very comfortable with the amount of, the, of inventory we have of Santa Bombs. So, should something happen, we were able to, we'll be able to res uh, respond very quickly and use the, that product, which is very effective in uh, killing a lot of stuff. Um, provide extra custodial help. Some of our schools, you know, custodians out for, you know, sick reasons or uh, personal reasons, what have you. Uh, when the school asks uh, if they can get some extra hours for the custodians that are there, we're granting that so we can ensure that our schools are, uh, we're maintaining the level of cleanliness that we uh, expect each and every day. We're also working with our vendors to uh, to ensure that we have future availability of the product. We don't want to go and buy a product and pigeonhole ourselves to where we're not going to be able to get the product moving forward. We've been assured by our vendor that we will be able to get the uh, refill products for those dispensers uh, on an as needed basis. Some other things you'll see across the district, we, uh, we began a campaign of putting hand washing uh, posters and signs, uh, signage across our, our, across our campuses. I know Ms. Blair's working on a, uh, a, getting a video out to our elementary schools about uh, washing your hands, a proper way of doing that. And one of the more, um, one of the more labor intensive things that we're doing is we are going through and we're inventorying our uh, faucets in our bathrooms. A lot of those faucets have the, uh, they're adjustable and they may run, the water may cut off automatically after about 10 seconds or so. I've uh, directed staff to go out and inventory the, the sites where those faucets are, and we're coming up with a way to either A, adjust those faucets or replace that, that fixture. So you can tell that's a, that's a uh, very costly expense, but it's also uh, very labor intensive, but that's something we're gonna do because the CDC does recommend washing your hands for at least 20 seconds, and so we're gonna make sure we can. And will you address the hot water, because Vicki was on our committee and she brought that up, the teachers were asking about washing their hands. Yeah, the, the, there's more value in you washing your hands with water. It doesn't have to be hot water per se, but you, it's the friction with, uh, with why you're rubbing your hands under a flow of water for uh, 20 or more seconds. So that's the reason why we're making those adjustments to our faucets. Mr. Bishop, um, we have a wellness center. That's great. Do we, do we know anything yet about um, kits to, to determine whether someone has the virus or not at this point, or is that something that's done through the health department that they're coordinating that as far as the kids availability I have yeah. not, we have not had a conversation however we have had a conversation with florida blue uh florida blue's come out uh, for those fully insured uh, fully insured although we're self insured fully insured patients that are their uh, tests are being covered and so we're working with florida blue to see if there's an option for us to do that on the self-insured side as well okay. so those, on, those conversations are ongoing because i know that we're not there and let's hope that we never quite get that far but um so I just, I am so grateful to the district, Mr. Bishop, for you know spearheading because I think we are taking a common sense um, approach to this and, and I'm, I'm just very proud of, of where we're going with this. So I think it's just, it'd be helpful when we do have an opportunity to meet just to maybe keep us updated on, on this as, as you guys have been including us in all. One other thing they talked about this evening was um, testing and as of right now there are no plans to suspend any testing. 
Now that can change in a week or two, but their um, hope is a lot of kids are on spring break. Of course, they're curious now where the kids go on travel, go on our cruises and travel, and how they monitor them when they come back. There is no way to monitor where people go on vacation. So they're just um, hoping people are honest with them. And you know, University of Florida, it was announced they were going to scale back. Um, and do more online teaching as a result of that, and they were they were working that direction. Again, I, I don't know that that's where really is necessary to, to go to that step right now, but I, I think that just knowing that we have those options and plans and we're, we're looking at them gives me uh, the comfort I was looking for. Thank you. And Mr. Gage, the only thing I had was with the cost of replacing faucets. But those it won't be the entire faucet. It'll be the will be the head of the okay, faucet. Okay, but that ten second. I think our kids are pretty well trained. You just hit that thing again, it goes another ten seconds. And then you recontaminate your hand. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I think y'all be glad to know that also on our call today that <coughs> Disney World has seen no decline in hotel bookings or attendance. And I can, can tell you, my son will be there tomorrow, so oh. we'll be contributing <laughs> to the taxes there. Um, I, I want to lift out two. Um, someone who has been truly making an impact um, in, in an area that we kind of overlook but is going to be very impacting to this district. FAFSA. Um, anybody who's got a kid in, in college knows we annually fill out our FAFSA, which is a federal, um, you know, to, to determine what, if any, funding you may get, but it also is used to determine sometimes your cost at a university or college, and it also impacts the dollars that come back so to give students options. Um, there's been an effort to try and increase that. Um, this, this board with the superintendent's um, support um, agreed to have um, Mr. Bittner um, you know, provide that as an agent. And uh, he had actually shared some numbers recently. And I think it's, it's again, incredible of what's happening. Uh, Citrus High School's already had 311 um, students that had signed up for FAFSA uh, so far through March 1st. Crystal River had 314, Lacanto had uh, 377. It's a direct effort of, of that um, with the superintendent. And, you know, to give you an idea of what those dollars, at the very minimum, some of those dollars, it also impacts their bright futures because there is a connection between the FAFSA figure skyward and, and that application. So you're talking about for a lot of students, that's there's $21,000, $28,000 right there. Um, but, you know, Mr. Bittner, we, we, we kind of forget, he also goes around to the schools, and he doesn't just for Lacanto, but he goes to Chris Grover and Lacanto and identifies those students that um, may be National Merit eligible. Um, and he works to inform the guidance department to say, hey, by the way, you've got a student here. He doesn't just do it for IB, which, we all know what an amazing job he is there, but he does it with the other schools. And you know, he offers a, a uh, SAT, ACT prep. Uh, and then you know, Golden Citrus, he works with the Golden Citrus staff to make sure that we really have a very equitable and, and great system. But I just had a chance to, to, to get a report from him um, at um, a foundation that he's a part of, and I, I'm just, I just felt like I needed to lift out his name here. And then lastly, you know, we had expulsions earlier. They're really tough. The public doesn't get to see that work that we do, but I just have to publicly say to my board, um, I am grateful to serve with you and the superintendent and the executive team because those are tough decisions we make, and I think this board works very, very hard to be making decisions that can positively impact those that make infractions, well, making sure that students are safe and secure, as Mr. Dodd would say in the classroom. And um, so I'm just grateful to you. That's it. Scott? Well, we have the uh, Stone and Douglas update on Friday. Uh, appreciate the work of uh, the superintendent and Mr. Moore and Mr. Bishop, all the work that's gone into uh, getting, the, getting people there to hear the message. And, uh, Sheriff's Office and school resource officers and uh, first responders. So I think we'll have a good turnout. And I appreciate uh, Curtis Pearson, one to three. Sheriff Bill Terry, uh, who's the chairman of the March Stone and Douglas Commission, will be there. Um, and uh, so it's just another part of how we continue to focus on school safety, right? And, um, 
it's, it's been over two years since this had happened, but there's still a lot to learn, a lot that we can um, maybe apply some things here. So um, I'm glad that we're going to do that and do that together. Uh, we have a safety and security meeting uh, on Thursday. So I didn't know if there's anything uh, any of you had to bring up and we did talk about the uh, individual panic buttons uh, at the last meeting and then wait to see if there's something that happens in the legislature um, with that. Uh, but I didn't know if there's anything specifically uh, for this meeting. Um, but uh, the Make from Trades dinner is uh, Friday with the Future Technical College. Make from Trades dinner is Friday at 6 o'clock at the County Auditorium, and then um, I know some of you all went to the disaster fishing trip was a lot of fun. Uh, yes, the Sky Association, so it was uh, my face, and it's, um, it does a great job with that program. That's so all I have. I was going to ask a question about um, made for the trades, and you answered it for me. Um, how much is that? Who do you give the money to? Oh, if, good. You, if you buy it, um, if you buy it from WTC, you don't have to pay a fee. But Eventbrite um, has a way to you can order it online, but there's a fee involved. Uh, but the uh, here's the prices. Uh, Time in one meal, not all that gold and silver stuff. It was gracious. I'm going to need that much. I think it's, I think, I think it's, isn't it $50, Sam? I think it's $50. I think it's $50 a ticket. Thank you. Yeah, this actually has, okay. If you want to be a platinum sponsor, you need tickets. No, no. Not that hungry. No, but you know what? Next year, I can't be there because I'm going to swim meet that night. But maybe next year as a board, we could. Become a sponsor, and then we just get all of our tickets. That'd be great. Yeah, that's true. All right. Very good. Thank you. That's all I have. I just mentioned tonight the art show over at the Central Florida College. We're heading there. The Anzo High School art students will be showing them a little presentation right before they get some to see all the beautiful visual artists. Oh, and this article I read that said those people involved in the arts visual arts, dancing, whatever uh, form of arts you're involved in, that uh, they live 31%, they don't die, 31% don't die if they continue to hear that. I know that's going to be forever, it's not going to be eternal, <laughs> but as compared with the other people. Well, that's right. Yeah. I had a tech meeting and um, was the schedule middle last night and um, they're starting. So um, again, I think that's a good idea to, to maybe include them in the tech meeting too. They all have a little bit of money and, and they all have good organizations. So um, that's something that we can all investigate. Then I have uh, something on my agenda Friday at 11.30 that we have to join our superintendent who's going to be speaking at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we'll be there. We're all going to be there. Citrus Hill. Yeah. So, um, again, uh, it's just, we're working just about as fast as we can. You mm -hmm. know, double booked it a couple times, but we got a, we got about 17 minutes to get to the Kento High School. Or, or no, is it first? No, no, it's at CF, isn't it? CF. Yeah. CF, yeah. CF. Yeah. 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 And, and the presentation tonight. starts at 6 30. Oh, it's fine. I think it's yeah. about Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Friday. Yeah. No, Friday yeah. tonight. Okay. So is there anything else? No. No more? Okay. All right. There's no other business to come before the board. This meeting stays adjourned.